Hello everybody, how are you today? Here we are, module 7, we're moving right along, pretty good clip. We're on the downside now, right, we passed the halfway point. I hope you all are healthy and doing well. Let's talk a little bit about Annika and her sister Penelope. Yeah, Annika wants to be, wants attention paid to her right now, so we'll see how that, how this works. Uh, so here we are in Cologne, Germany, also known as Cologne, uh, and this is the dawn. This is a cathedral, giant cathedral, uh, kind of world famous, truly amazing. I got to go on a travel abroad uh, with Ohio State 17 Buckeye undergrads, and Ilana Sager, graduate student, and I uh, were responsible to go to Germany, Belgium, and London, and it was a great trip. So. Boy, I sure got a lot of photos, and, and uh, even better than that, I got some fantastic memories. So let's talk culture. Let's talk about subculture. Uh, I'll say this right now. If uh, I could easily live in Germany, there's something about the culture that resonates with me. It's very organized. Uh, I like the people. Uh, it's very systematic, and, and I think it kind of fits my view of how a country can be run effectively and efficiently. Let's then talk about negotiating cultures and the differences that we might find in culture, some of at least the broad stroke differences, if you will. One of the places that we see first and foremost in uh, social psychology is attributions of causality, and that's a simple way of saying why did that happen or why did they do that? To what can I attribute the cause of that behavior? And we find that this is a pretty good place to look at the difference, at least between collectivist and individualistic cultures. So in, in this case, when we see culture and causal attributions, collectivist cultures are more likely to explain behavior by invoking situational causes. So, so when they see something happen, rather than point to someone, a dispositional cause, and say, hey, that person did it, they look and they say, they look at a myriad of causes, a relatively complex array of causes, and talk more systemically than individually. Right? Individualistic cultures are more likely to explain behavior by invoking dispositional explanations. So if they see an accident, they say, oh my god, who was the driver? Uh, what were they doing wrong? Poor driver. Uh, collectivist cultures might say, well, this area of the freeway is designed in such a way that it facilitates a greater number of accidents, so they take a more systemic or holistic approach. These differences occur in situations that invoke social processing rather than just explanations of physical movement. Now, Morse and Ping, right, and this is largely attributed to them, they tested individualistic versus collectivist students and what they did is they showed them videos or pictures and, and, and they talked about, hey, when, when the fish, when one fish would move away from the other fish or fish would follow a single fish, what they found is that people from collectivist cultures talked about the fish's relationship to the group, right? Whereas individualistic cultures tended to focus on the individual deviant fish, if you will. And that's not deviant necessarily in a bad way, but that say, oh, look at those fish are following the fish, right? Instead of the fish happens to be ahead of the fish. So attributions tend to be more complex in collectivist cultures, and they tend to be more systemic. So it's something for us to adjust to because in the United States, as an individualist culture, we see an individual as the prime mover and tend to explain or search for causes. If something goes wrong at work, who did it, right? Rather than how did the system fail us, and, and that's a big difference. Now, the ripple effect, collectivist cultures make broader, more complex attributions than individualistic counterparts, and Maddox and Yuki gave us this. Maddox is a buddy of mine. He and I went to graduate school together. We entered in the same year. We spent a lot of time together. Um, we're pretty good friends in, in, in that regard, and what I see with Maddox is he's in Japan. He lived in Japan for four years. He was teaching English to Japanese in, in Japan, and he told me about this time he got involved. And he didn't get involved directly in an accident, but he was, he was involved in a delay as a result of this accident. It was a huge accident. It was hours long. And, and he went to read in the paper, 
in Japan about the accident the next day and he was blown away by the story because they're saying like well so many people were inconvenienced and here's what you know what potentially caused the accident was all these elements and all these circumstances and it talked about this big picture the ripple it was and how many people that were late to work and how this affected businesses and he says I've never read a story like this in the United States about an accident a story about an accident in the United States is this is what happened, this is who caused it, and this was the result, boom, to that person. What he said is, is this true? After he went through this, he, he said, is this true? And then he prompted him to do the research. And he named uh, this, this effect the ripple effect. And, and he said there's two mechanisms that are at work here. For collectivist cultures, there seems to be a greater awareness of interconnectivity, how one's actions affect everyone around them, which is often absent in individualist cultures. You know, the Popeye effect. I am what I am, and that's what I am, and I'm going to do my shit. I'm Popeye, and damn everyone else, right? It's often kind of an individualistic attitude. I got to be me, right? And it's like, collectivists are like, I gotta be us, and I gotta make sure that us is good, right? And then the level of accountability, and we see in collectivist cultures, there's usually a higher collective, uh, you know, accountability and less individual accountability necessarily. So the assigned responsibility for the accident then, well, what did Maddox and Yuki do? They went through the records, it's archival research, and they looked at, articles that described accidents and they look for these elements so to what extent the assigned responsibility for the accident well we see in Japanese much less to the person the self uh, than the Americans a huge difference there uh, assignment of responsibility to the driver uh, about equally high uh, assignment to the government yes commuters to a greater extent and the greater responsibility for the accident so we can see that there's this general idea that there's more involved than one individual messing up which would be an individualistic culture's kind of stopping point rather than a starting point so we see then the ripple effect pre and post event the Japanese right all these antecedents so they take into account all these potential causes right the focus of Americans is going to be on the action the accident itself and very little that led to it and very little that results so there'll be a description of the accident but the Japanese then take a more holistic view listing all the potential antecedents and then the all the potential consequences of the accident as well so we find in general if you are going to deal with collectivist cultures and this is psychology of adjustment so I want you to consider that you're moving to another country or getting a foreign assignment has never been higher for an American than it is now and it will probably continue to increase as we see the economy continue to globalize more on this later we're going to take a brief deviation and, and deal with some subculture ideas here what do you think about that you got anything to say all right not so much let's look at subcultures and this is our next assignment so I got it embedded in here what are subcultures? Well, within the United States, it'd be hard to say, is there, is there an American culture? And yeah, I mean, there's kind of a, a, a large American culture, but we are a diverse country and geographically diverse. So there might be several subcultures that are within, right, our culture. Uh, where I come from, Southern California, surfing was all the rage as I was growing up so surfers were a defined subculture right and it was weird because I grew up in the valley which was on the other side of the hills inland from the coast and when we would go to the beach right it was obvious to the surfers who were at the beach that we were valley boys and valley girls yeah that's the actual term right and, and we were of a different so subculture like totally uh-huh right so we spoke a little differently we behaved a little differently and we were not as welcome on the beach as, as necessarily other people would of the surfer subculture so deviance is often a component of subcultures they deviate from the mainstream culture if there is such a thing the one uh, that I want to describe is, is the culture of honor and Dick Nisbet and, and his graduate student Dove Cohen Dove Cohen was a southern boy he comes to University of Michigan to work 
with Professor Nisbet, who is one of the leading cross-cultural researchers, right, you know, in, in, in the world. And, and Cohen proposed the idea that Southern males were more likely to respond bond with aggression to insults or infractions than northern males. And Nisbet, you know, is going to eat this up because he's a cross-cultural researcher and says, what's your evidence? How do you know? And, you know, he just, Cohen describes some colloquial, you know, kind of uh, individualistic kind of uh, observations, but they put it to a test and they designed an experiment to demonstrate that southern males will more likely respond physically to insults and aggressive overtures than northern males would. And it was described then as the southern culture of honor growing out of a more agrarian rather than a more citified, if you will, or a more urban north, we have a rural south. And people in the south were more inclined to have to take care of themselves. So they would not allow insults or slights to go unresponded to. Northern males might shrug them off. Southern uh, males, it was time to get busy. This is also then akin to a gang culture, if you will, in, in modern day parlors, where toughness becomes a primary quality. If your gang is insulted, you must respond. You cannot let it go, right? So that represents a subculture. The idea is what other subcultures might exist in the United States, and, and there's going to be myriad examples. Now, I want to approach the deviants here through Stout's take on sociopathy. And sociopathy is not a legitimate construct in psychology. You got psychopathy by Dr. Harris, the gold standard. We talk about psychopaths. There's criteria. Uh, there's assessment, all that kind of good stuff. We have antisocial personality disorder that comes to us out of the DSM, including DSM-5. And, but right in the middle is sociopath, and there's no standard for sociopath other than what Martha Stout has developed in her book, The Sociopath Next Door. But this is not an established psychological construct. I think it should be, and I campaign for it in many of my courses. But ASPD is legit, empirically demonstrated, psychopathy empirically demonstrated, sociopathy, this middle ground, remains unempirically differentiated. So in her book, what does she show us? Well, you're going to be classified as sociopath, according to Stout, on the basis of having any of these three characteristics. So what we see is it's a little tighter criteria maybe than ASPD, but certainly a looser criteria than psychopathy. So egocentricity, if someone's egocentric, or they're callous, impulsive, have a conscience defect. I love that term. It's an oldie but a goodie, right? Someone that demonstrates exaggerated sexuality, excessive boasting, risk-taking. They take risks, imprudent risks often. Inability to resist temptation. They fail the marshmallow test. Right? They're antagonistic, deprecating attitude towards the opposite sex. Right? and lack of interest in bonding with a mate. So the idea is if you, if you observe any of these behaviors in a person, right, any three of these, then according to Stout, we can begin to describe them in terms of fitting the subcategory of sociopath. And here's Stout. I'm sure that if the devil existed, he would want us to feel very sorry for him. And note that most people who screw you over big time love to play the victim role and it's actually those people that got hurt. Uh, my neighbor who is who is a sociopath, no two ways about it. Uh, egocentricity, he thinks the world exists for him. Impulsive, he has no ability to delay gratification. He has no conscience. He's got a criminal record longer than our street. Right? I, don't, I don't know about the sexuality. The boasting, he boasts all the time. Um, Risk-taking, sure. Inability to risk him. Uh, antagonistic. I don't know how many times he's threatened to kick my ass, right? Uh, these are all qualities, right? But, but so Marvin, you know, threatened me the other day because I was asking him about our property line and he was talking about building a fence. And I said, we should, we should get a survey done before we put any more fence in. And then he just started screaming at me, right? And, and threatened me and threatened to blow up my house and, and kill me and all this good stuff. And I'm just like, dude... I'm not sure exactly where this is coming from, but the sooner it's over, the better I like it, right? Uh, 
he came to the house the other day to apologize. And will you accept my apology? I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to do that. But it was about him. It was still about him. Will you accept my apology? Please accept my apology. So the egocentricity still comes through at that point. I'm supposed to feel sorry for him. Now, I do feel sorry for him. But, you know, that doesn't mean I'm going to trust him. Now, four types of sociopathy then based on the distribution of characteristics. Stout offers us the commons. These are characterized mostly by their lack of conscience. Right? Now, the alienateds, these people are, are more in the camp that their inability to love others or to be open to receiving love. The aggressives are, are demonstrate a, con, uh, a consistent sadistic streak. And then the disocials. This is an interesting category, and this is why I bring it up in terms of subcultures. Disocials have an ability to abide by gang rules, for example, as long as those rules are the wrong rules. So this becomes interesting because some groups, you know, demonstrate themselves as deviant. And it's that deviance that defines themselves. But they're following, you know, maybe a very strict program or, or a very uh, narrow set of rules. As long as they're the wrong rules, they're rules that deviate from the mainstream society. So when we look at subcultures, right, Sociologists can be a big help here because they look at larger forces. Groups tend to hold different values and define success as different than the dominant culture. Right? And you say, oh, those stupid gang members, what's wrong with these people belonging to a gang, etc.? And, and in interviews with gang members, the interesting thing is they say, well, what about all these gang symbols? And, and, this, and gang members will say, well, this is a language we use to communicate to each other that no one else can tap into. So the police can't observe us communicating because they don't know what the hell we're saying. Other gangs can't. And, but they say, well, what happens if someone decodes your symbols? And they says, well, we just generate a new language. And I'm thinking, these are not stupid people. If they detect that someone has broken their code, so to speak, what do they do? They develop a new one. That ain't stupid. That's hard work. And that's pretty damn bright, right? So a lot of times we fall into these kind of simple-minded stereotypes. Uh, gang members are dumb, okay? No. I think a lot of gang members grow up thinking that they don't really have a future role in society. The society is not opening its arms to them. Is They perceive that society is creating a lot of impediments to them succeeding by the established rules. So they develop their own rules, but they have rules and they adhere to those rules quite strongly. Gangs have tremendous hierarchies. They have systems of rewards and punishment that keep gang members in line. So it's a subculture, but it's a bona fide culture. Right? Now, social psychological research on self-esteem, disidentification with the domain, result in loss of self-esteem, we discussed this in the self chapter. And if I believe, you know, that I'm going to school in Detroit in this crappy school that no one cares about because there's no property taxes to pay for the school, the teachers aren't very good because the schools can't attract good teachers because they're poor schools that are falling apart. And I'm sitting there day after day saying, this is getting me nowhere. And this is going to prepare me for nothing. And when I get out of here, I'm going to be unemployed just as I am now. So I need to do something a little differently. And it's the perception that mainstream society doesn't hold something for me that will often drive me into kind of participating in a subculture. It can also have a value expressive function as well. So you see when we see these gang tattoos, etc., it enhances self-esteem. Now, one gang that we've seen uh, kind of increase its membership and its uh, outward identification has been Nazis, American Nazis, neo-Nazis, etc. And they're sporting swastikas. And notice, this is a, a source of pride for them, right? And uh, so Nazis would represent a subculture within the United States. Hard to believe in this day and age. I'm at a, at a loss to understand it. But. So let's talk about homework 11. And this is naming and designing subcultures. Right? So what is the subculture? How do you define them? And I think what I'd like you to do here, if you're willing to do it, if you want to take it on, is you know, kind of name your own subculture. Like I've named Nazis, I've named gang members, etc. But, you know, uh, and surfers. Uh, but I'm sure you grew up, you know, well, yeah, duh. 
let me let me state that a, a little differently. As you were growing up, I'm sure you encountered groups or cliques. Let's say a clique is one place that you might start to look then in your school that, that defines a subculture within that school. But no, you can do this anywhere. Uh, one subculture, another subculture in the United States that you guys probably aren't familiar with, right, was folks who were named dinks. What is a dink? I know you guys are thinking, oh my god, he's flipped. He's going to say something real derogatory now. Not so much. Dinks, double income, no kids. Right, so this is a subculture within the United States. These are two professional people who join up. Right, it could be same sex, it could be opposite sex. That doesn't even enter into it. Right, but their dual income—that is, they pull both their professional incomes, which can be relatively good incomes, and they have no kids to spend that money on, so they can live relatively well. Now, there are things they sacrifice, but what would we say about the Dink subculture? Well, no, we can start building stereotypes about the dink subculture. We can, we can use terms, etc., and, and we develop behavioral expectations. Bless you, sweetie. Yes. So, what I want you to do then is develop a subculture within your team, name and design it. You can, you can make your own, you can identify one, whichever. But then what I want to know is how do you define them? What are three things that are necessary to be a member? So, if we're talking about dinks, should be, I think, professional people. They're probably going to be educated, and they don't have children, and they both work. So I've given you like four elements that define what it means to be a dink, right? What stereotypes are outsiders likely to create for this subculture? And I see the dinks up on High Street, right? Up in, up in the short north, out on the patio, uh, drinking wine that's too expensive, and eating hors d'oeuvres, and, and, and that kind of good stuff, right? Or you, you get the idea. So, and then what behavior is likely to get a member kicked out of that subculture? So what is a deal killer? What is a norm violation uh, for a group like that? Okay. And then finally, what does their subcultural standing mean for their adjustment challenges and strategies? Now, if you're a dink, right, family affairs can be relatively harsh. Think about it. You're dual income. You got no kids. People say, "Well, when are you going to have a grandchild? When are you going to make me a grandparent?" So that's something that they're going to encounter in, in in family situations, right? So, uh, and, and they have to adjust to that. Uh, what about time off to help with children? A lot of you know, a lot of dinks complain that they do the bulk of the work at their place of employment because the people with kids are always cutting out. My kid's sick, I can't come to work, or I have to go to graduation, I have to go to this game for my kid, right? So who's left to do the work while the parents are sloughing off? And notice, I'm using these terms. I don't necessarily endorse what I just said, but this is the perception uh, of the dink might have of other people. So what are the adjustment challenges that might? And one or, one or two examples is, is cool for that. Does it make sense? Okay, so you good? All right then. Let's call this the end of part one, and we'll move on to part two.